Recently, when compiling a list of my all-time favorite games, I ran into an issue when considering the potential inclusion of, ironically, one of my most played games of all time, Melee. I've spent thousands of hours playing this game, and it should be entirely obvious by now that I enjoy it a lot. So much so that I'd probably say it's the most fun game I've ever played within the rules and confines of a community-created rule set with a community-curated stage list. And while it's true that these are rules that anyone could come up with and play on, and certainly part of Melee's base game despite not being the default, could I really consider Super Smash Bros. Melee one of my favorite games of all time if I've only enjoyed such a small portion of it? And after some careful deliberation, I've decided that the answer in my opinion is no. no. Here's how I thought of it. Would you consider Dark Souls 2 one of your favorite games if you thought the PvP was incredible? Or for a more apt comparison, Fight Club PvP, with set honor system rules stating that fights must always be 1v1, no healing items or Estus allowed, and that you must allow your opponent to buff before beginning the fight. Would you consider World of Warcraft one of your favorite games if the only part you enjoyed was min-maxing or twinking low-level characters to fight less geared players around your level? Or if you only enjoyed fair duels outside of Orgrimmar with no potions or buffs? I think most of you would agree with me that no. Despite enjoying these incredibly small parts of the game greatly, considering the game one of your favorites of all time because of these small parts would be... strange and perhaps even requires you to ignore greater flaws with the games in more significant areas. So, of course, the logical conclusion is to review and critique the game as a whole, 20 years late, with the added context of the modern world and the Smash games that came after it. The idea being that it'll get me lots of YouTube views and ad revenue, but also, maybe after giving the game as a whole an honest shot, scrutinizing every aspect of the game, I'll be able to confidently place it among my other favorite games, or instead find that the overall game hasn't held up well. Let's get started. I think it's important to begin with one of Melee's most unique, enjoyable, and to most spectators, coolest aspects, its movement. Wow! What is the movement, eyes? What is the movement? This is obviously universal in Melee. Wave dashing, wave landing, dash dancing, shield dropping, and even more niche options like moonwalking. It's all there regardless of which mode you're playing on or whether you're playing against a human or a computer. However, some of these techniques are difficult to learn, exacerbated by an almost entirely absent buffer system, making advanced techniques and even extremely basic actions like moving, aerials, and grounded moves extremely precise. For those of you unfamiliar with the term, buffer in a game refers to when the game reads your input before you can actually perform that move. For example, to perform a frame-perfect aerial in Brawl and Onwards, which have quite generous buffer systems, you simply press jump and the direction of the aerial you want to perform at the same time. Really no timing required. In Melee, however, the complete lack of buffer when doing this will result in either a smash attack or a jump with no aerial. The game doesn't keep track of what you input on your controller when it's in the middle of doing something else. Because of this, frame-perfect aerials in Melee are truly frame-perfect on behalf of the player. And this isn't just limited to aerials, either. Almost nothing has buffer in Melee. There's no leeway, just you and your will to grind out the timing of the lag on every move you'll be performing to be done as fast as possible. This is quite understandably a turnoff to some people, especially those used to the buffer systems in place from not only Brawl onwards, but the majority of video games today. This is because game developers realized that pressing a button a few frames too early and having nothing happen would feel like complete shit to most players. I often see people coming into Melee from games like Smash 4 and Ultimate say the game feels clunky or unresponsive due to this, or that the game feels like it's eating their inputs. And starting out in 2016, I felt this way too. It was frustrating coming from the most recent Smash title, which was then Smash 4, to Melee. Funnily enough, despite being the fastest in the series, 
Melee's characters felt slow and cumbersome to control. In fact, the game kind of felt like complete ass. But I wanted to do cool stuff like I saw in GR Smash compilations, so I looked up tutorials and seriously practiced for months. I grew to enjoy the process of practicing and the visual improvement that came along with it. But the word practice isn't exactly what most people have in mind when playing video games. Especially a Nintendo game meant to be played by little kids. And it's not really a process some people want to go through just to be able to play the game at a level that even resembles competitive play. Even to those uninterested in playing like the pros, in the modern day, the lack of buffer is increasingly archaic and, frankly, unfun to work around at first. And if the game itself feels bad to play and you're uninterested in practicing to take advantage of what mechanics make Melee so special, what reason is there to play Melee when compared to games like Ultimate, which features far more characters, stages, items, collectibles, everything? Target test? Multi-man Melee? If you feel or have felt this way about Melee, I don't blame you. It's all completely valid criticism. Most games today have buffer and like I said before, lack of it can seem extremely dated. But behind its precise controls and lack of buffer lies something incredibly fun and rewarding. Movement that can be exciting, meaningful, and flashy all at the same time. Movement with such freedom and fine control that it far, far exceeds anything else in the series. Or even most video games for that matter. If you've ever wondered why Melee players stick to their game instead of hopping to the current Smash Bros. title, this is one of the reasons. Here are a few examples of movement options that make Melee's movement so fluid, fun, and fucking crazy. Edge Cancelling Aerials, which is exclusive to Melee in Smash 64, allows players to completely cancel landing lag by landing near an edge and sliding off of it before the move's lag would have ended naturally, allowing follow-ups and combos that are otherwise impossible. Melee's infamous wave dashing and wave landing are deep, multifaceted exploits that can be used in a myriad of ways, such as quickly sliding across the ground as a microspacing tool, mixing up basic movement, allowing characters to perform grounded moves while moving, closing or increasing distance while maintaining the same direction, or to quickly grab ledge, among other uses. Additionally, these techniques increase the depth of play with one of Smash Bros. most distinctive aspects as a fighting game series, platforms. You can wave land on platforms to land on them more quickly than if you were to jump on them, wave dash off of platforms to escape pressure out of your shield, quickly aerial at heights that would otherwise take much longer, or use it as a mix-up on your aerial, on top of much, much more. Wave dashing and wave landing also exist in Ultimate, the only other entry in the series where the directional air dodging that makes the technique possible exists. But the practicality of these two techniques have been absolutely gutted, as air dodging has added startup frames and becomes slower the more you use it. Furthermore, the lag from landing by air dodging into the ground is massively increased, and you can't wave dash or wave land off of platforms. All of this done in an effort to simplify the game, lower the skill ceiling, and narrow the gap between casual players and professionals. We'll explore the implications of Ultimate's more limiting platforms further in Part 3. A big part of what makes Melee feel so unique among the Smash games and its continued success and longevity as a competitive video game in my opinion, is just how fucking fast it is. Characters fall like they're made of lead, they attack fast, they run fast, and unlike Brawl, Smash 4, and Ultimate, they maintain their running speed when jumping. They don't just abruptly slow down when they leave the ground. With such mechanics in place, combos are able to be extended further and with way more creativity than in its sequels, as characters aren't limited by how quickly they can move to follow up. 
And when the game's natural speed is combined with the advanced movement options we went over earlier, players can get really creative. Melee's peak speed is absolutely unparalleled in the series because of the combined speed of its characters and the movement capabilities the game's engine allows. And it's no surprise that YouTube commenters sometimes genuinely question if footage of competitive Melee has been sped up. This isn't to say that Melee's movement isn't without flaws. A part of Melee's movement system that bothers me is something called dashback, the act of going from a neutral standing position to turning around and dashing away at full speed. Simple, right? Well, no. To do this and skip the relatively lengthy turnaround animation requires a one-frame input on the player's controller from a neutral position, past the walking zone, and into the dash zone. For perspective, one frame in Melee, which runs at 60 frames per second, is 16 milliseconds. To really drive this point home, this counter is currently displaying a number from 1 to 60, representing the individual frames in this 60 FPS video. You have, at most, the time it takes for this counter to increase by 1 to complete this motion and not have it fuck up. I say at most because the odds of you beginning this motion right at the beginning of a frame are very low, so on average you'll have about half the time it takes for this counter to increase by one. All to do this. I'm dead fucking serious. Besides the one frame timing required for this action, your controller itself can affect how consistently you perform it. If you get lucky and happen upon an extremely rare controller with a malfunctioning analog stick box, yes, malfunctioning, this action becomes much easier to perform consistently. These broken controllers are coveted among top Melee players, and you might be familiar with this article about Armada dropping out of a tournament because he didn't have one of them to compete with. Why is dashback so important? Well, in Melee, the difference between a successful dashback and an unsuccessful one can be the difference between punishing your opponent or getting punished yourself, sometimes even resulting in losing a stock. And it's gonna come down to how consistently lot of the chain grabs into stock. And right now, not looking good, but... Having a relatively normal, simple action that even casual players will perform have its input leniency be reduced so much as to be controller dependent is bad game design. And things like this are some of my biggest gripes with the game, as they throw a wrench into the competitive loop of studying, practicing, and application by making two of the steps dependent on external factors. Melee is a precise game in itself, and players' practice precision shouldn't be affected negatively by external factors such as controller differences. Oh! Lock and, load. and most people agree with me, as a mod called UCF, or Universal Controller Fix, was made to increase Dashback's leniency from one frame to two, and thus make it less controller dependent. This mod is even used at some super majors nowadays. However, controllers can also affect things like wave dashing, ledge dashes, and shield drops, the latter of which is also adjusted with UCF due to its controller dependency. Manufacturing discrepancies cause the optimal inputs for these precise techniques to vary from controller to controller, and unfortunately, they're all extremely important in competitive play. It's gotten to the point that people have started selling controller modifications at a premium, to file away at the perimeter of the analog stick gate to notch shield drop values for consistent shield drops, maximum length wave dashes, or the steepest possible angles for Fox and Falco's up B. These modifications are incredibly popular among mid and high level players, and I'd imagine that most, if not all, of the players on Melee's Top 100 have these modifications on their controller. Among other modifications such as removing springs in the triggers or soldering capacitors to the inner board of the controller to reduce things like snapback. 
While I personally don't have any problem with the actual practice of selling things like this, it certainly represents an issue with the way Melee is currently played compared to how it was meant to be played. And this is where the issue lies with me. As I said before, these external elements on your controller shouldn't be a factor in how well and consistently you're able to perform actions in-game. Admittedly, some of these are issues that non-competitive players likely won't notice, but because of the game's heavy use of these techniques in competitive environments, it's worth bringing up as criticism to the overall game. You might find it odd to complain about these aspects of the game when the mods I mentioned fix these things, but to me that's the equivalent of the equally ridiculous mods will fix it mentality that's common to Bethesda games and bad PC ports of the modern era. Just because you can fix these issues via mods, it doesn't mean these issues are free from criticism. Plus, some competitive tournaments don't even run with fixes like UCF in place, and players looking to play the game on its native hardware might not even have access to these fixes at all. Such heavy importance on controllers is the sad reality of a game whose beautiful, complex, unique mechanics are often the result of player experimentation and engine manipulation, rather than developer intention. But because a lot of these same or similar elements are also elements I've already listed as positives, I believe it's important to be objective and fair in explaining why mechanics that make melee distinctive and fun also sometimes end up being a bother as well, regardless of what was or wasn't intended. With the exception of Subspace Emissary and Brawl, which was a complete, interesting single-player experience with a story, actual levels, and a ton of cool bosses, I've never really been too big a fan of Super Smash Bros. single-player, and Melee is certainly no different. I don't think this is an uncommon opinion either. After all, Super Smash Bros. is a fighting game, or a party game depending on who you ask. It's largely meant to be played with another person or a group of people. To put it lightly, the single player options in Melee are... adequate. Because what modes exist in Melee were, for the most part, done better in later installments, whether it be for the increases in roster size and thus content and variety, the addition or expansion of certain modes, or the fleshing out of ideas featured in Melee. Event mode consists of 51 separate challenges, mostly shallow ones with gimmicks like your opponent being metal or big or small. These can be fun, but they end up feeling a bit samey after you've done a number of them. Classic mode makes its return from Smash 64, but unfortunately many of the different levels in classic mode just feel like random event mode matches strung together where you're just fighting some random CPU taken from a small pool of characters with a gimmick attached, like them being metal or big or small. Stage 11 in particular, where you fight both Master Hand and Crazy Hand, is just Event 50. I'd imagine this was a lot of fun back in the day, but it's mostly lost its luster, especially when compared to the classic modes that came after it. Ultimate's classic mode, for instance, massively improves on Melee's formula by having a theme related to each individual character. For example, Pikachu's classic mode only involves Pokémon, whether it be Pokémon fighters or Pokémon stages, and the only items that drop are Pokéballs. There are also a good amount of final bosses rather than just the hands, which are always the final boss in Melee. The best part of Melee's classic mode, and the one thing it does better than Ultimate's, are the target test stages. Each individual character has their own unique target test, and they're designed around that particular character's moveset. Target test is completely absent from Ultimate's classic mode. Instead, all you've got is this shitty race to the finish kind of thing that's the same for every character, which is lame as fuck. Much like Classic Mode, outside of the two legitimately interesting Mario and Zelda levels, Adventure Mode just ends up feeling like a bunch of Event Mode matches stitched together, and some of them even straight up are Event Mode matches, meaning beyond those two levels I mentioned, there's not much difference between Adventure and Classic. Ultimate's Adventure Mode is called World of Light, and it has the worst fucking theme I've ever heard in a video game.
World of Light gives you a world map where you can pick and choose your gimmick fights while unlocking characters permanently. You can equip spirits that let you start out battles with certain items or give you things like attack and defense bonuses, on top of a dedicated skill tree consisting of a number of passive effects. These keep things relatively fun for a while with your spirits slightly altering how you fight, but even with these spirits, World of Light becomes a bit tedious. And unfortunately, the bosses of World of Light are also the same ones you fight in Classic Mode. Still, it ended up being a lot more fun than Melee's Adventure Mode to me. All-Star is an endurance mode where you fight through the game's roster while managing three heart containers that reset your percentage. This is an interesting concept if only for this metagame based around these three hearts, but like Adventure in Classic Mode, it ends with an exact copy of an event. I mean, they couldn't come up with something new? What, were they short for time or something? On top of most of these ideas being better realized in later installments, the movement and speed that makes Melee so unique and enjoyable serve much less of a purpose when playing against computer opponents in these single-player modes. Instead, on harder difficulties, much of the gameplay ends up revolving around cheesing or exploiting the questionable AI. Home Run Contest, a fan favorite, makes its debut in Melee, and it's just as good as ever. But just like fighting computer opponents in Adventure, Classic, and All-Star modes, it barely makes use of Melee's unique and fun mechanics. So Home Run Contest ends up just being something you'd rather play in one of the other installments, where you have a wider selection of characters. Barring nostalgia, single player is just something that was done much better in the games following Melee, even if they're all just varying degrees of boring to me. It should come as no surprise that what I think Melee most excels at is its multiplayer. It's here that you can use the tools and techniques discussed in Part 1 that make Melee so fulfilling, technical, and cool to their utmost potential on human opponents. <laughs> Supplemented by these movement options is the amount of hit stun most moves have. Indeed, attacks in Melee have, on average, some of the most hit stun in the entire series but not enough to be what I'd consider overbearing like in Smash 64. This lends itself well to extended combos that test a player's execution to perform, as well as the receiving player's ability to escape. Combos that, thanks to the aforementioned hit stun, as well as things like platform and stage movement, are extremely dynamic. Because of these fundamental differences in combo length, Competitive Smash 64 and Melee players place the most emphasis on developing a strong punish game as opposed to strong neutral when first beginning their respective games. This trend continues into higher level play as well-practiced players can often take a stock in only one or two openings. Brawl and Beyond place more emphasis on neutral due to their smaller amount of hit stun and decreased speed, and thus shorter combos. While which you like more is down to preference, I think there's something to be said about how much more creative, complex, and entertaining combos are when you have more options to move and more time to follow up. One of the biggest differences between Ultimate and Melee, at least competitively, is how players of each respective game use and interact with platforms. In Melee, platforms are extremely versatile and mechanically deep. Many players base their entire playstyles around platforms and how they use them to their advantage. It's a reminder of how much more freeform neutral and combos are when platforms are fun and easy to move around on. In games like Ultimate, however, the same platforms that make Smash Bros. as a series so unique represent how the developers have chosen to limit the amount of options to move and interact. For example, the aforementioned removal of edge cancels for sick combos and otherwise impossible plays. <laughs> removal of shield drops for quick counterattacks, And the removal of nearly all possibilities to interact with them via wave landing and wave dashing. Whereas in melee, platforms are often used to stretch an advantage, play defensively in combos, to play neutral around, or simply just to mix your opponent up, it seems Ultimate's best players tend to actively avoid platform play due to their limitations on getting off of them and playing around them. 
Within Competitive Ultimate's fluctuating list of legal stages, I almost never see traditional three-platform stages like Battlefield and Yoshi's Story played on. Instead, Ultimate players much more commonly opt for stages with fewer platforms, Final Destination, or stages with their platforms so off to the side that they may as well not be there at all. Platforms in Ultimate, a platform fighting game, seem almost always disadvantageous to be on. There are rarely creative instances of use because of the lack of edge cancelable aerials. There are seldom instances of counterattacks on them because of the removal of shield drops. And there are significantly less options to move and interact with them due to the nerf on wave dashing and wave landing. It seems that they more get in your way or fuck you over than anything else. In this way, platforms in Ultimate are more akin to stage hazards than an element of strategic and thoughtful play. While the movement issue is most pronounced on platforms, many general advanced movement options that were in games like Melee, Brawl, and Smash 4 have been taken away and replaced with… nothing. I very often see Ultimate players lament the removal of advanced movement options that were in these past games. The removal of perfect pivots? Kinda makes it so we don't have that many options off of a platform, as you can't perfect pivot drop through a platform, it's kinda tough. But another thing that got taken out was shield dropping. Shield dropping, I tried living it, I tried a lot of different control schemes. It doesn't seem like they have shield dropping in this current build of the game. It's really tragic, it makes shielding on a platform feel kind of rough. These are understandable criticisms because who doesn't want a deeper and more freeform game to play? Who wants to be limited further in how many ways they can move? To Masahiro Sakurai, the creator and director of the series, the answer is casual players. But the truth is, casual players don't give a fuck if these options are in the game. Hell, most of them probably don't even know they exist. Casual players will enjoy it just the same. The only thing these oversimplified mechanics do are negatively affect the people who want a deep, competitive experience, which is supposedly the audience the game was made to cater to. Well then, please enjoy the very first Smash Brothers Ultimate Tournament. Because of these differences, on top of things like how different every character is comboed due to Melee having the widest range of weight, fall speed, and gravity values in the series, much of Melee's depth comes from how much there is to learn about and exploit how each individual character can move to either combo or play neutral, while Ultimate's depth is instead more based on its huge roster size, comprised of more simple characters and mechanics. This and the sheer amount of characters to choose from are a huge reason as to why games like Ultimate are much, much better games for casual play. The limitations in movement and combos, as well as the copious buffer, make the game more accessible and intentionally narrow the gap between those who want to play for fun and those who want to play the game competitively, just like Sakurai wanted. While because of the extremely tight, precise controls that take practice to even get used to, smaller roster and somewhat flat single player modes, Melee is somewhat of a casual, unfriendly experience compared to later games. The breadth of difficult techniques characters can use to deepen and enhance their play in competitive environments instead make it more suited to tournament play. Of course, this leads us to the question of balance. How balanced is Melee? I've already done a pretty in-depth look at how many characters are viable in Melee, but when discussing balancing in relation to Smash's more contemporary installments, Melee, perhaps surprisingly, is right up there with Ultimate. Now, it'd be unfair to fully compare Melee's nearly two decade long meta balancing to Ultimate's, a game with a young meta and more patches and characters on the way, but it's entirely safe to say that there are no completely meta centralizing characters like Meta Knight in Brawl and Bayonetta in Smash 4. Of course, Fox is very popular, you see him very often in competitive melee, but in no way do his in-game tools and results come even close to Meta Knight's nearly uncontested dominance or Bayonetta's ban-worthy superiority and ease of use. Fox mains make up 26% of melee's top 100, which is admittedly a little crazy. However, Fox is similarly overrepresented in all levels of play, 
all the way down to low level as evidenced by character surveys and data taken from other sources. He makes up 21% of all players who participated in ranked play on Smash Ladder, a site for dedicated netplay matchmaking mostly consisting of low and mid-level players. Because anyone can partake in ranked play and because netplay is how most people play Melee nowadays, we can reasonably infer that this is roughly indicative of the character representation among Melee's cumulative player base. But in spite of this, last year Solo Fox McCloud won the same amount of tournaments as Falco, and two much less popular characters, Pikachu and Falcon, won. Within Melee's current metagame, which commonly holds around 20 combined majors and super majors a year, Fox is lucky if he gets a few victories at most, and the scene hasn't seen a true Fox main dominate since Leffen's short stint in 2015. Not exactly characteristics of a fighter that's overpowered or meta-centralizing. Instead, for the past half decade, Melee's meta has been ruled by Hungrybox, who plays Jigglypuff, a character with a losing matchup to Fox, and Armada, a peach main with a Fox secondary that he uses for Hungrybox. You see Fox often in Melee not because he's overpowered or over-centralizing, but because he's so popular at every level of play. I'd argue that this massive amount of representation compared to the number of tournaments he wins, and has won for the past 10 years, actually lends more credence to the fact that Fox is perhaps less good than what the majority of players give him credit for. And at the very least, not meta-centralizing in any way. Now, I'm not claiming Melee is the most balanced game in the world, but among Melee's viable selection of characters, competitive Melee is balanced just fine. There are very few horrible matchups among these viable characters, and any of these characters are capable of winning a major. Especially if you're mid-level, low-level, or pure shit, you can find success with nearly any character on the roster and it's not until you actually become a semi-decent player that this list of viable characters even remotely matters. I'd be remiss not to mention Melee's online solution, a modded version of the GameCube and Wii emulator Dolphin that's been optimized for Melee, aptly called Faster Melee, specifically tailored and adjusted for net playing over the internet with other people. Netplay is optimized to an insane amount, and given a proper setup, you can actually play the game with others over the internet with less input lag than on its native hardware. In fact, less lag than Ultimate has offline. Of course, you'll probably have to procure the game through questionable means if you want to play the game on PC. But it goes without saying that this is by far the best online the series has to offer, and it's not even close. For example, on an absolutely perfect connection, Online Ultimate has a minimum of 12 frames of lag, while Melee's netplay can be changed to your liking by manually adjusting what's called buffer. One buffer is equal to a quarter of a frame of additional lag, and you add one buffer for every 8 ping between you and the other player to keep the connection stable. Because Faster Melee alone has less lag than playing on a GameCube or Wii, to most people, 6 to 8 buffer is considered a good connection because it's roughly equivalent to the lag experienced while playing Melee on a CRT. To put this into perspective, the minimum 12 frames of lag in Ultimate is equal to 42 buffer. Not double, not triple, not even quadruple, but 5 times the amount of lag on a solid netplay connection. Minimum. I want to emphasize that I'm not just saying all of this just to shit on Ultimate. I think Ultimate is a good game, and it's actually decently fun to watch, too. Which isn't something I could have said in good faith about Smash 4. The game does better than Melee in some areas, most notably character balance, the amount of viable characters, controls such as customization and non-controller dependency, and single player as I've already mentioned. Many Melee players are able to enjoy both games concurrently, including myself, but Ultimate as well as Brawl and Smash 4 have undeniable restrictions on gameplay that hinder the depth of play that Melee has. These criticisms are instead primarily to explain how Melee still holds up and sometimes greatly exceeds these games in certain areas, even 20 years and 3 mainline releases later.
Today, much of the discourse in the community ends up being based around the two Smash games that currently have active, healthy scenes, Melee and Ultimate. Melee, in some aspects, has mechanics that are almost egregiously complex and finicky, some requiring physical controller modifications to perform consistently. Conversely, Ultimate sometimes feels needlessly simplistic, limiting, or just strange in its design philosophies. But because of these differences and how much more it has to offer in terms of characters, stages, music, and quality single-player content, Ultimate ends up being, holistically, a solid game in its own right that will appeal to many more people, just not one with the level of interactivity, freedom, and depth that Melee has competitively, which happens to be the small part of Smash that I enjoy the most. There are more ways to move in Melee, more ways to combo, more ways to interact, and, ironically, despite the difference in roster size, debatably more ways to play. To me, this makes it more fun to play and watch. However, beyond these competitive-centric criticisms, this begs the question. If you're not interested in what Melee has to offer at its fullest potential, is it even worth playing? To me, the answer seems clear. No. Melee isn't worth your time beyond the novelty of having played it if you're not interested in learning, practicing, and implementing what makes the game unique. In fact, if you play it without that desire, you might find yourself frustrated by its antiquated controls and relatively small roster and amount of stages. If you are interested and willing to invest the time, however, what awaits you is the best, deepest, and most rewarding competitive experience the series has to offer. Is Melee one of my favorite games as a whole? No, but damn, do I love this small part of it.